Hello, everybody. Uh, this is again a session in two parts institutions, reforms, and politics. It's remarkable. Is there anything that's left out? Uh, I can't imagine anything. We begin with a, a presentation of a paper on a diverse monetary union, joint paper by Oscar Sohns and uh, Enrico Perotti. It will be discussed by Roberto Perotti. We have uh, 25 minutes for the presentation and then uh, 10 to 15 minutes for the discussions and afterwards a, a general discussion. So uh, without any uh, further loss of time, may I ask Oscar to present, uh, to proceed with the presentation. Yes, hello everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Martin, and thank you for the, uh, to the organizers of the conference. So I'll present uh, my work with Enrico Perotti on a diverse monetary union. So first, I want to start with two figures that motivate uh, this paper. So this first figure shows that the European Monetary Union is an institutionally diverse monetary union, DMU. So institutions are hard to uh, measure. What I use here is data published by the World Bank on six indicators that proxy for aspects of institutional quality. So I listed them below. They capture, they try to measure stuff like accountability, uh, regulatory quality, rule of law, and control of corruption. So these are standardized uh, indicators. So what I did is I averaged them for the main core and periphery countries in the Euro area where the blue are the core countries and the red ones are the periphery countries if the uh, names are too small. So what it shows is that at the beginning, at the onset of the Euro, there was quite a difference based on this measure. Um, and to give you an idea, the core countries are within the 90th percentile of this data, uh, while the per periphery countries are mostly between the 50th and 70th percentile in this data. So it seems to really be a dif uh, difference. And the first question is, well, why do such diverse countries choose to form a monetary union? And then the second figure shows that uh, this measure of institutional quality did not, diver uh, did not converge over time. So what I did here is I uh, averaged over the core and the periphery countries from the previous figure. And I plotted over time from 96 to 2018. And you see it didn't converge, and if anything, it seems to even diverge. Right, so that brings us to the second question that we have, that we want to study, well, what then are redistributive consequences across and within countries of such persistent uh, differences? So we offer a political economy framing to these questions, where our view of institutional quality is that it reflects persistent informal and formal constraints on governance rules, that is in the spirit of Douglas North, his work. And we will model institutional quality as weights on the political choice. And then we study uh, the policy cho choices of politicians that then are driven by this institutional quality weights. So within this framework, we will uh, analyze the economic adjustment to a DMU, to, to the common currency, where financial prices converge instantaneously. So interest rates and exchange rates immediately reflect the new monetary situation while nominal wages adjust much more slowly and institutions do not adjust at all, motivated by the data I showed. So what do we uh, find in this paper? Well, just to be clear, we abstract from any real and risk sharing benefits in the DMU and we really focus on financial effects of these differential adjustment speeds. Right? And there are three financial effects that we focus on. First, an interest rate effect which means that as soon as uh, there's a credible common currency between these diverse countries, then a weak government may benefit from a lower interest rate because there's no more devaluation premium. Second, there may be a debt volume effect, which means that in weaker countries, uh, because the price of borrowing is now lower, there might be more borrowing, but it also might gain access to uh, 
foreign investors, for example, safety seeking investors that they previously were not able to get funding from. And so these two effects are quite you know, well studied, but then there's a third effect that we particularly want to focus on, which is an exchange rate effect. So this follows from this differential speed of adjustment. So the intuition here is that if you have a, a country with strong institutions and a country with weak institutions, so a country with a strong currency and a weak currency, and you lock them together in a common currency, then the common currency will reflect, in our view, uh, uh, the common characteristics that will be valued somewhere between the strong and the weak currency uh, on their own. Uh, so this will mean a devaluation for strong currencies and a revaluation for weak ones. So then based on these effects, uh, we have some results. So first, the exchange rate effect will lead to an immediate redistribution of fiscal capacity in favor of strong economies, where fiscal capacity what I mean with that is the local currency value of domestic production. Uh, then second, the DMU uh, could be a stable equilibrium outcome, but it may require fiscal transfers and downturns because this weaker economy cannot devalue anymore. But importantly, these transfers will be in the interest of the strong country to sustain this fiscal capacity benefit. So in the end, the DMU will be sustained, even in case of a transfer, if the probability of default, so the probability that the weaker country needs to transfer is not excessive, and the devaluation benefit of the current cur common currency is sufficiently large for the strong country. But even in that case, when a DMU is agreed upon and sustained, it does not necessarily improve productive incentives. Moreover, it may even reduce productive incentives in some weaker countries because it's the politicians that will choose to join and they may only be partially driven by productive uh, incentives. So there will be some redis productive redistribution between countries. And we also argue that there will be some redistributive consequence within countries, for example, between public employment and private employment. So of course, I mean, we, there's a big literature, we stand on the shoulder of giants, but in the interest of time, I will not uh, really get into detail. Instead, I'll go straight to our model. So the model set up, there's two countries with open economies and there's two periods, where in the second period, there, will be, there could be two states, either a good state or a bad state. Uh, and the state of the world determines the price of a single traded good in the economy. So either a high price or a low price. And the state is perfectly correlated across countries. So this means that in this monetary union, there are no risk sharing benefits. So we only focus on these financial effects. So each country consists of households, firms, and a government. And the only difference between the two countries will be the quality of the political institutions under which the politicians of each uh, country operate. So in the background, there will also be a reference country, for example, the rest of the world. So initially, uh, both countries will have an exchange rate with respect to the rest of the world. You can think of it as dollars. Um, and this rest of the world also supplies and demands safe public debt, which means that we want to we abstract from any safety premium uh, consideration. So the household starts with an endowment of local currency only at period T is zero. <clears throat> and it gets utility from consumption of the single traded good and from public goods provided by the government. So consumption big C and public goods capital V of public spending G. So the household can invest its endowment either in uh, firm equity or it can save in domestic or foreign government bonds. And the household also supplies labor elastically to government and firms, so it will work as much as demanded at a given rate, which is a nominal wage W, which is uh, constant in local currency across countries and is exogenously given. So this assumption reflects that, in our view, wages are also largely determined by national characteristics. So firms uh, produce and they only use labor as a single input. Uh, they have a concave production function with some minimum uh, big A. And the timing here is gonna be important. So firms pay their wages before they sell their goods on international markets, which means that at T0, they need financing. 
So they will issue equity. So how, how so households will buy the equity so that the firm can pay the wages. And they issue equity proportional to their labor choice, which they make anticipating future profitability. So they will anticipate future tax rates, exchange rates. So they also anticipate a devaluation and future interest rates. Then at year zero, they produce, uh, they pay their wages, and then they sell their goods for this uh, price, either high or low, theta. So and then the real wage cost of this firm will be determined by the exchange rate because it sells its goods uh, for this dollar price theta, but it pays its wages in nominal, in local currency. And afterwards it pays tax taxes and profit, but uh, firms will evade extreme taxation. And so it will not accept just uh, extreme taxation at some cost C, and this will determine a maximum tax rate, and I will get back to that later. So then the government. So politicians uh, will either choose for an own currency or to join a monetary union. Uh, and good institutions will support production while politicians on the weak institution, they value their political benefits given by capital D, G more. And so you can think of this either as private or public corruption, these, these political benefits. What I mean with that is that these benefits could be private corruption in the sense that you know, they are able to benefit from it themselves. Or uh, political benefits could also be uh, to increase the probability of re-election or to stay in power. And in a very divided society, this might require them to spend more to appease all uh, challenging demands or all opposing interests. That's actually our preferred uh, interpretation. So then this institutional quality we model specifically as weights on in the objective function of the government between zero and one, where let's say there's perfect institution, so beta is one, then a, a politicians only care about this term, which is productive uses of resources. So it's the uh, real firm, uh, the, the dollar firm value plus the value of public goods. In that case, you know, the, the, let's say the first best public spending would balance this positive marginal uh, effect of public goods with a negative effect on production because the more you spend, the higher taxation will be. So there's some interior uh, spending outcome. But then if you have imperfect institutions of so beta as less than one, then politicians additionally value these political benefits, which means that they will be tempted to spend more. So then there's a third term, which is a, a cost function of certain policy choices, which I will explain in the next slide. So based on this, politicians will choose public spending, which they use to provide public goods by uh, hiring labor also as the only input, and they don't have an endowment, so they issue uh, government bonds to pay for this. And then to repay this, their debt, they uh, set a tax rate exposed sufficiently high. But as I said before, firms evade extreme taxation. So this will determine a maximum tax rate or a maximum fiscal revenue that a government can obtain. And when a government is sufficiently weak uh, or an institution is sufficiently weak, it might spend so much that the required tax rate will exceed this maximum tax rate. In, in which case uh, it has two choices. It can either devalue or default. So that is that cost function P. And for simplicity, we assume that political default costs are simply very large. So governments will devalue, which reflects kind of the situation in Europe before the Euro. So a devaluation then is anticipated and it lowers real wages which means that it actually increases firms' incentives to produce today, which helps, uh, which increases the fiscal capacity uh, in the final period. So this comes at this political cost, but additionally, a country that devalues, then the government cannot obtain funding from foreign investors anymore, which then we think of as safety-seeking funding. And finally, sovereign interest rate also will include a devaluation premium uh, when needed. So then the exchange rate, final part of the model. 
so if a reduced form exchange rate function where the, you know, we simply say that deficit countries will have a weaker exchange rate. Or in other words, if you're a surplus country, you accumulate reserves and you will have a stronger currency. And in particular, we uh, model this as the exchange rate is given by one minus K times your current account. So current account would be a surplus or a deficit and that's in normal times. I mean, if you, devalue, if you devalue, then your exchange rate is given by uh, whatever is required for debt repayment. And then this parameter K, the elasticity of your exchange rate to your surplus, that is a, an important variable in this model. And we assume that it's of intermediate uh, magnitude. Why? Well, if it's too high, then a government that spends more will have such an exchange rate benefit that this spending will simply pay for itself, in which case you will get to a corner solution of infinite spending. So we rule that out. And we also rule out that if you spend more, you will have a stronger exchange rate. But we also don't think that's an interesting case. So to summarize the model then, so firms first and government, firms issue equity and government issue bonds and households invest in these uh, instruments and firms and governments hire labor. And in the next period, firms will produce. There's a state of the world that determines the price of the good. Governments know whether they have to devalue or not to repay their debt based on the state of the world and labor is paid. Then goods are sold, taxation is paid back to the government and all investors of all financial claims are paid. So that's the full model. And first, before I explain what happens in a common currency, what happens when countries have their own currency? And importantly, under this assumption of intermediate K, so basically immediately from this intermediate K, it follows that strong institutions mean that there's less public spending, which means lower tax rates and a larger surplus because there's less domestic absorption of the initial endowment. Uh, this larger surplus then leads to a stronger currency and finally more productive investment. So strong institutions under this intermediate case support production. While on the other hand, weaker institutional quality countries, they spend more and if they're sufficiently uh, weak, then they may need to devalue in a low state. And they also may be constrained to domestic savings because they cannot, international, cannot get, obtain international funding. So in a diverse monetary union then. So still in this, in this model, there's different types of DMUs you can study. So we particularly focus on a case of interest where countries are sufficiently diverse, but not too diverse. Right? So this means that we study a DMU between a weaker government that uh, is constrained and may devalue in a low state and a stronger co government that will never devalue. So it has a very stable currency. And additionally, uh, the weaker government is not too weak, in which case uh, it, will it will increase spending by so much that the common currency will be weaker than the weak country currency on its own. So we also rule that case out. So that puts a bound on the institutional quality of the weak country. So we will, in the paper, we show existence of such an equilibrium using a simulation. And we also analyze the comparative statics, but that's in the paper and will not be in this presentation. So what is the impact of this, of such a DMU? Well, first in the uh, weaker country, now the government cannot devalue anymore as soon as there's a credible uh, common currency. So as a result, it will enjoy this lower sovereign rate. And also it may increase spending because of this lower price, this lower taxation cost of public spending but also because it has a relaxed funding constraint because it used to be constrained by assumption. Uh, then there's the third effect, which is that the common currency now uh, not only reflects the common current account balance, but there also are no more devaluations. So for these two reasons, the common currency will induce a revaluate, induces a revaluation, and this increases real wages and lowers fiscal capacity in the weak country. So fiscal capacity is lower, while the government will increase spending, right? So these are two uh, things that reinforce each other. Then the overall productive impact in the weaker country will depend on this devaluation premium. So that's the benefit, this lower interest rate, 
compared to the change in spending in a new fiscal capacity. And so we show that uh, the important variable that characterizes this is the probability of the good state. So if that is sufficiently large, then production in the weak country will benefit. And the intuition here is that only in the good state, this benefit, this deep interest rate benefit is actually captured because in the low state countries still are constrained and tax rates are already the max, maximum tax rate. Then in a strong country, so the strong country does not have an interest rate gain and there's only a minor effect on public spending. The important effect in a strong country comes from the common currency again where it reflects the com combined current account balance. So for the stronger country, this implies a devaluation, which in contrast to the weaker country here, decreases real wages and increases its fiscal capacity. Right? However, to sustain a monetary union, it knows that it may have to fund this transfer in a low state. Right? So here, the proposition is that, again, if the probability of the good state is sufficiently large, then production in the strong country benefits because the expected transfer costs are sufficiently small compared to this constant fiscal capacity benefit. So that's the impact, but when is it going to be a credible equilibrium outcome? Now, again, this is when institutional quality is within certain ranges. Why? Because the size of the transfer depends on both institutional quality of the strong country and institutional quality of the weak country. And so when institutions are within these ranges, then the strong country, strong government will join because it values its productive benefit, right? this coming from its exchange rate benefit, and the weak country will also join. It may be because it, uh, it production benefits, but it certainly will value its increase in spending more than the stronger government. So then uh, that is the uh, between country redistribution. So productive incentives are redistributed by the exchange rate effect. Then we also try to uh, study within country redistributive effects of such a diverse monetary union. So although you know, we have a representative household, we try to do this by looking at each payoff to different uh, you know, types of people in this representative household. So you think of investors who invest in firm equity, productive labor, so that works for firms, and public labor who work for the government, and then savers in government bonds. So in the stronger, and then particularly here, this, these tables are for the case where uh, the stronger country has productive benefits, while the weaker country production uh, incentives are reduced. So in that case, investors, in firm investors in a strong country benefit in a good state, but in case of a transfer that they have to fund, it's uncertain, but in expectation, they certainly benefit. So productive labor is harmed by lower real wages, but it benefits from more production, so it's also uncertain. While public labor is certainly worse off because of lower real wages, and also, at least in our simulation, every simulation we tried, the government also always lowers, slightly lowers spending. Um, and savers are worse off here because their savings are revalued under a common currency. Um, so then in the weaker country, there's a different view. So investors are worse off because of this, uh, because, you know, the that because production is, is harmed. Productive labor is questionable now because real wages are higher, but production is lower. And public labor certainly benefits because it has higher real wages and the government increases spending, so increases total employment. And for savers, then it depends also on whether they avoid a devaluation or not. Okay, so to wrap up, so this paper, we uh, study a model of formation of a diverse monetary union and then its economic consequences. So the main you know, takeaway from this work is that you know, a diverse monetary union is redistributed from the start before any uh, fiscal transfers take place because it immediately implies currency D and revaluations. Um, so a DMU uh, may undermine productive incentives actually because politicians are the ones that choose and they may be partially self-interested or partially driven by uh, political benefits rather than productive benefits. But still, 
you know, a DMU uh, is credible when a strong country benefits, and this will even be the case in case of a occasional fiscal transfer in crisis times. So thank you for your attention, and I look forward to uh, the discussion in the breakout room later. Okay, thank you very much. The uh, discussion will be Roberto Perotti. Please go ahead. Uh, you're muted. I'm muted, yeah. You need to unmute. Thank you for inviting me. And let me share. Okay, can you see the, can you see my lights? Okay, so um, thank you very much for inviting me. This was a very interesting paper. I should say that uh, I'm not related to one of the two authors of the paper that did <laughs> two parodies in Italy, but we are not related and maybe going back a few centuries. And I wanted to say that because I wrote a paper on families in the Italian university system. So it's important to make sure. Uh, so, there is a common story about the euro that says uh, core countries have benefited by locking in a depreciated exchange rate at the beginning. So this has imposed the recession on periphery countries, but they still want to stay in uh, for reasons that uh, nobody really understand according to the story. And the other part of the story is uh, that, which is I think popular in Northern European countries, is that periphery countries have squandered the interest savings from uh, the euro, which was substantial. In the case of Italy, it was probably about between five and seven percent of GDP. So this model captures these features very elegantly through two main mechanisms that have been uh, explained very well: the exchange rate mechanism in the core countries, a real exchange rate mechanism and the interest rate uh, mechanism in the periphery countries. So let me go briefly over the uh, structure of the paper because uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, the, the, it has no close form solution. So I think it's important to make sure uh, we understand the main channels um, of, uh, the, uh, of the model. So as was explained, the uh, government spending enters the utility of the represented agent and in the weak countries, uh, politicians have a preference for uh, high uh, government spending. And there is an upper bound on the tax rate. Beyond that, uh, the country has to devalue. So if more than the, that tax rate is needed uh, to repay the debt in full, the tax rate, the weak country has to uh, devalue. They are uh, only traded goods and uh, they are quoted in dollars. There is a fixed nominal wage in domestic currency. So a depreciation of the nominal exchange rate reduces the production wage and uh, leads to higher production and therefore to a higher tax base. And uh, another feature of the model is that uh, a higher public spending causes, of course, the lower current account, uh, uh, current, uh, lower current account, and the exchange rate is related uh, to uh, the current account. The lower current account causes a depreciation of the exchange rate. So weaker countries, have a more depreciated exchange rate, essentially. By weaker country, I mean a country with a weak uh, government, a, a government that has a preference for government spending. So what are the effects of uh, higher public spending on production given the tax base? Well, one of them is depreciation, so higher production, but on the other hand, uh, it uh, leads to a higher tax rate, so lower production. And only in a weak country, there is a higher probability of devaluation, which is incorporated in the interest rate. So that increases the cost of debt, a higher tax rate, lower production. So the model assumes that the first effect is weaker than the second effect. So other things equal, higher government spending hurts uh, production through the uh, higher tax rate. Uh, in a, uh, in a monetary union, the exchange rate is a weighted average of the two exchange rates. So the strong countries, when it participates in the monetary union, experiences a depreciation of the exchange rate, uh, essentially a decrease in the real production wage. And the weak country experiences an appreciation. 
And you can think of the monetary union as the combination of two things, the commitment not to devalue by the weak country, plus the appreciation of the real exchange rate in the weak country and the depreciation in the strong country. So keep in mind that these are the two things that happen when um, uh, the two countries enter a monetary union. Um, and then uh, uh, for the commitment not to devalue by the weak country to be credible, uh, uh, you might have to add a commitment by the strong country to a transfer uh, to the weak country in the bad state. So what are the effects of entering a diverse monetary union where the diverse monetary union is a, is a monetary union with a weak and strong countries participating? So we need to look at the effects on production and on government spending and in the strong country, I think this is what happens. The depreciation raises the tax base. So there is an upward pressure on spending. The positive probability of a transfer in the bad state uh, exer exerts a downward pressure on spending to make room for the transfer in case uh, it's needed in the bad state. So the net effect on government spending is ambiguous, but at least in the simulation, it turns out that the tax rate falls if the probability of transfers is sufficiently low, which is intuitive. So in, uh, in that case, the production in uh, uh, the uh, strong country increases when it joins the diverse monetary union, essentially we are through a depreciation effect. And remember that production is essentially what matters in the strong country because politicians don't have a particular taste for government spending. What happens in the weak country when it joins the monetary union? There is a decline in the interest rate because of the elimination of the probability of a devaluation. That allows for higher spending, it relaxes the uh, constraint, uh, the budget constraint of the government. If the government is sufficiently weak, so the decline in interest, the interest rate is sufficiently large when entering the union, then government spending increases. That's, uh, I think, what, what, what is happening. In terms of production, there are several effects. There is an increase in production because there are lower interest rates, so that reduces the tax rate, the expected tax rate. Production increases because uh, uh, the expected transfer reduces the expected tax rate in the past state. Uh, production decreases because of higher carbon spending and it decreases because of, of the appreciation. So the effect on production is ambiguous. In the paper, in the simulation, if the government is very weak, the devaluation premium uh, prevails. Um, so the decline in the interest rate is large uh, and uh, that decreases the lower, the expected tax rate and that increases production. I think uh, this is what happens uh, behind the, the result of the simulation. So, if you put this together, what are the incentives to join a diverse monetary union? For the strong government, remember, it only cares about production and the uh, production increases essentially because of the exchange rate effect. So it joins and as, if I understand correctly, the strong country is better off the weaker the weak government because uh, that causes a higher depreciation. The weak uh, government well, the, the politicians there benefit from high public uh, spending and public spending in general increases in, uh, in when uh, the weak country uh, accesses the monetary union. And that might outweigh the loss from uh, lower production. Production can go up and down, rem or down remember that it's ambiguous, but even if it goes down, the benefit from higher public spending uh, over, uh, outweighs that in general. So, uh, 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 joins, the government joins if it's sufficiently weak because it benefits more from the higher spending and it also has a, a bigger interest rate uh, effect. So this is, I think, an elegant way of showing that a diverse monetary union arises endogenously. Um, uh, and moreover, uh, the two countries are happier to join the more diverse they are. And uh, uh, there is higher production in the core country and the uh, recession and persistent recession in uh, the periphery. Of course, this is assuming that the commitment to a transfer is credible. Uh, 
uh, to make sure that in fact export uh, the strong country uh, will make good on the commitment you need a, a repeated interaction uh, model and uh, they also show that uh, that uh, um, uh, result can be sustained uh, even with large institutional differences uh, even in a repeated interaction setting so let me make three comments uh, uh, as i said i think that model is very elegant and it captures very very important features a very very important story that is frequently told but uh, i'm not sure it has ever been modeled uh, only one piece. Uh, let me uh, make three comments on three um, conclusions um, of the authors, with which I'm not sure I completely agree. So, if I understand correctly, uh, the so the first part is a statement uh, of the paper, uh, and then there is uh, what I think is an interpretation, a conclusion that the authors derive from it. The uh, in the paper. Uh, in the model, the euro, uh, the creation of the diverse monetary union, redistributes productive capacity from the core, from the uh, periphery to the core countries, and therefore it requires transfers in the, in the, in the bus states to the uh, periphery. Unlike in the model, in reality, uh, sovereign countries cannot. Uh, commit to the transfer. So in the conclusions of the paper, the authors argue, argue that you need a supranational fiscal authority with a true fiscal capacity to make sure that enough resources uh, are allocated to the weak country in the bad uh, state. I'm not sure I agree with this uh, conclusion because the underlying distortion or the, or the whole the whole problem arises because there is a weak government in the weak country so a government that has uh, whose politicians have a particular taste for um, for uh, government spending so if you really want to have a fiscal authority with true fiscal capacity by which the authors mean being able to allocate um, uh, government spending directly then you have to the, the i think the, the right way to do it in the model is to eliminate the distortions by allocating less government spending to the weak country in the good state. That eliminates the need for a transfer. Uh, of course, there is a problem of transition here because the, the, the weak country has accessed the diverse monetary union with a weak government. So it has entered with, with a, uh, a overvalued exchange rate, uh, but that's a different problem. So the second comment I have is that in the model, the uh, diverse monetary union locks in an overvalued real exchange rate for the weak country, whatever over overvalued means, but we understand each other on this point, and uh, <clears throat> reduces their productive capacity. I think there is uh, evidence for this persistent effect. This effect is persistent. The overvaluation is persistent. And here you see in uh, orange, the Harley, relative Harley compensation of Italy versus Germany between 1971-2010, and in blue, the um, exchange rate. And of course, since 1995, when it was locked in, it's uh, flat. And also the real relative compensation is pretty flat. Uh, uh, actually, there is a slight re re increase in Italy versus Germany. But so it, the, the, it doesn't go away. The overvaluation doesn't go away relative to uh, the beginning of the 90s. So that it is persistent. However, uh, uh, many German economists would, uh, certainly people like Hans Werner Sinn, would argue that relative unit, Italian unitable cost continue to increase even after the uh, exchange rate were uh, locked in in 1995 uh, because of one issue that is missing in the model and um, this is not necessarily a criticism of the model cannot take account of everything but in real life i think that uh, the common story in one common story in germany is productivity uh, so here you have uh, countries ranged by uh, 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 productivity growth in um, 
we well, take the, uh, the the bar, the blue bar is the 1995-2014, and you see that the periphery countries were at the bottom. So this is labor productivity, and uh, uh, the northern European countries were at the top in terms of labor productivity growth. And of course, uh, it, some Italian economists. Uh, would argue that uh, that's true, but that's endogenous because log, log, uh, low productivity growth is the result exactly of the overvalued exchange rate with which Italy entered the diverse monetary union, which uh, caused a, a, a low demand, which uh, in turn caused low investment, which in turn caused low productivity growth. But what I want to say is that uh, uh the uh, it's true that it could be that uh, the real exchange rate was uh, locked in and these effects is persistent but uh, the real problem according to a story which could be plausible is in the behavior of productivity relative productivity between the core and the periphery the third argument is more loose. The third comment that I have, and the third uh, uh, error disagreement with I have with, the, with that I have with the author, is more loose. And it's a question: Is the boost to productive capacity the real reason why core countries stay in the euro? So it's it's, it's a very common story in Italy that uh, uh, essentially, to make it very simple, the uh, northern uh, northern Europe is uh, exploiting um, uh, southern Europe, the periphery. So it's exporting re deflation. That's a common expression. It's a very common view among sovereignists uh, in Europe, but not only sovereignists, among a lot of people. So the Germany is exporting deflation, which is captured here by the notion that uh, uh, the, the, that, um, uh, the diverse monetary union has uh, boost the productive capacity in Germany and uh, cause the a persistent recession in the periphery. I'm not sure that uh, that's uh, uh, the case. I'm not sure that that's the reason why uh, Germany and the Northern European countries stay in uh, the diverse monetary union. I think uh, uh, this is a loose statement that I'm going to make, but I think that Germany was pretty much indifferent to Italy's competitive devaluations in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s. It, uh, it was, it, it essentially didn't care. It was an Italian problem. And we know that, it, that the Germany tried to prevent uh, Italy and Greece from joining the Euro, and according to this model, it should not have. So why does uh, Germany stay in the Euro uh, for the moment? Um, uh, well, my impression is that it's mainly for political reasons and because of the general disruption, general spillover effects, mostly in the financial system that would uh, uh, follow from a breakup of the Euro, uh, Italy uh, outside the Euro would be a kind of loose cannon, both politically and economically, and the breakup would have enormous financial spillover. So, I'm not sure that the reason why Germany stays in the euro, which is, is in a sense even more um, puzzling than the reason why Italy stays in the euro, is uh, that it exports uh, the deflation and uh, exploits uh, the periphery. I think, I suspect, I cannot prove, of course, but my impression is that it stays in for political reasons and for fears of um, uh, spillover effects in the financial system. So these are three um, minor quibbles, but again, uh, the paper, uh, let me uh, reiterate that it, as far as I know, the first paper that addresses uh, this very, very important issue, why such diverse countries uh, stay in the Euro, and uh, uh, it uh, paints a plausible, a plausible uh, story, which is a story that is frequently told uh, in words uh, in Europe. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think there's time for one question. Uh, can you send me a chat, please?
and well, if there is if, if there is none, uh, I'll ask Oscar to briefly respond. The stresses on the word briefly. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Roberto, for your for your comments and your summary. Quite insightful, I think. Um, I mean, your first and your third comment. I think we could have very long discussions on this. Um, that I don't think I have time for now. Um, on your second comment, I think indeed I would then agree with the Italian economists that say, well, this productivity you know, difference is actually very endogenous to the exchange rate. Also, as you, you know, as you mentioned, because I mean, what we like our story is that you know, from the beginning, some countries were more advantaged than others within a common currency, and this you know, results. The result is a difference in productivity over time. Like this is accumulation of this. You know, this locking in different countries into one common currency. Um, yeah, so I'll keep it brief. I'm not sure if Enrico wants to quickly. Uh, yes, I'll be very brief. So, um, clarification. It is not the case that in the model, the strong country wants a very weak country to join. That's uh, There is a more interior solution. Uh, it doesn't want an extreme different country. And uh, there is actually no need for commitment in the model. So I don't think, I mean, I agree that you cannot commit, but it could be in the self-interest to remain. Um, I think that the point that you don't address is that the exchange rate effect in a context where institutions do not adjust, and I, we can disagree whether it's just that Italians are, you know, worse people, as you, or worse politicians, you suggest that. I think Italy is a very diverse country. But I think you don't talk about the fact that the redistribution in fiscal capacity partially legitimize the fiscal, the fiscal transfer. And that to me is what I learned out of this model. Um, so that, that strikes me. I will also very much disagree on the evidence of Germany trying to stop Italy. They wanted to have Italy to fix the fiscal balance, but the Italy was always going to be part of my union. And there was a, there was a lot of evidence work of people at Freedom, at Harvard, etc., about how very much the German manufacturers were heavily lobbying for Italy to be brought in. But I'll stop here. We can talk more in the breakout room. Thank you very much for that. We're clearly not uh, colluding here. <laughs> okay, I should. Uh, close this session, I want to do so with three remarks of my own. My interpretation of German unhappiness about EMU is Germans really love the 70s and 80s when every three years or so the mark was revalued. That was almost as good and much more reliable than winning the World Cup in soccer. And my recollection of the reaction of the French bureaucracy to the devaluation of the franc in 69 was they looked at the problem in the same terms, of course, in that year from the other side. So I think that in discussing uh, these developments over the decades, the issue of national pride attached to exchange rates did play a role. And mind you, I mentioned France because France rather than Italy was the main motor of all these developments. On the productivity side, I don't think we can talk about the decade after 2000 without talking about accession countries and without talking about China. I mean, the thing that's been called productivity here has a lot to do with those. And for some reasons that I don't fully understand, Italy was much more affected than uh, Germany. Uh, so uh, all these are just cautions against uh, 
sort of forgetting about the things that have been left out. On that note, I want to uh, hand over to uh, Dana. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present this paper, which is joint work with Massimo Morelli, who is also present at this conference. Um, and the uh, motivation for the paper starts from the observation that uh, technological changes create new products or fundamentally change existing ones in ways that bring about the need for regulatory reforms capable of addressing these developments. In many cases, and financial innovation is one such example, the need uh, for regulatory reforms implies also that these new reforms uh, must be complex. Uh, the uh, imposition of complex reforms is going to lead then to more complex regulation and more complicated legislative domains. And um, given these observations, uh, we want to ask the following questions in this project. First, we want to understand how political incentives, along with economic conditions, determine what types of regulations are adopted. When are complex regulatory reforms likely to be adopted and likely to be bad or unnecessary? What are the dynamics of complex reforms? And can this model tell us something about uh, understanding the patterns in recent empirical evidence on the relationship between increases in regulatory complexity, efficiency, and economic growth? At the core of this paper is the following policymaking process. A reform offer is made by a proposer um, and is going to require the approval of a decision maker. The proposer has better information about his type and about the state of the world. Uh, in this framework, we want to differentiate between simple and complex reforms. Simple reforms have an outcome that depends on the state of the world. If the state of the world favors a simple reform, then that reform is going to deliver a benefit. Complex reforms, on the other hand, have an outcome that depends on the state of the world, whether the state of the world requires such complexity, as well as on the pro proposer's private type or, or expertise, information, etc. Uh, the idea being that writing a complex reform requires skill um, rather than uh, writing a simple reform. And uh, these reforms um, not only have static outcomes, but they also have dynamic consequences. Uh, a complex reform is going to lead to a more complicated legislative domain in the future, once it is adopted. And in this more complicated legislative domains, future decision makers will have an information disadvantage that's larger. So they will have a harder time um, understanding which reforms uh, are required by the state of the world. So to fix ideas, um, I'm going to discuss briefly the mapping between this abstract framework and the application to regulation. We think about the decision maker as a regulator or a regulatory agency. And um, the proposer is going to be an interest group, presumably part of the industry that is regulated by the regulator. The private type of this interest group measures the alignment between the proposer's benefit from the reform and the public benefit, where the underlying assumption is that the regulator cares about the public benefit. The uh, reform complexity maps to the number of contingencies in the reform. A simple reform has few contingencies, so it corresponds to a reform where market participants are afforded flexibility within the constraints of broad rules, whereas complex reforms have many contingencies, so they are rules that spell out specific implementation steps. And writing such a rule requires expertise or information. 
An interest group may propose either one of those two types of reforms. Proposing a simple reform um, could be good because it allows the industry to retain flexibility over how to deal with a particular situation. A complex reform can be good because it enshrines the industry's preferred solution into regulation. For the regulator, however, a simple rule is good if the state of the world favors such simplicity, meaning that there's few externalities or contracting costs, so it is optimal to let the market find its own solution. A complex rule is good if the state of the world favors such complexity, so there are many externalities that require a lot of these contingencies to put it, be put in place, and on top of that, that the proposer is aligned so that the proposed rule is also in the public benefit. So given this mapping, um, we're going to derive the following uh, main results. Uh, there are more in the paper, but these are the two main results that I'm going to focus on in the short presentation. Um, one is that uh, overcomplexification, so unnecessary or bad complex reforms, emerge when the state of the world likely requires complex reforms, but there is uncertainty about the proposer's type. Um, dynamically, we obtain complexity cycles, so cycling between simple and complex reforms, when there is high uncertainty about the state of the world and about the proposer's type, and we obtain path dependence of reforms in which complexity begets complexity, um, when the state of the world likely requires complex reforms, um, which leads to um, complexity traps, as I described, with complexity begetting complexity. So the game is going to be a dynamic model in which every period we have the following um, game being repeated. So first, the nature is going to draw a state of the world, which can uh, be a theta s that favors simplicity, or theta c that favors complexity, the probability of theta c being kappa, and nature is going to draw a new proposer each period. Uh, the type of the proposer is going to be A or B, with the probability of A, that's the aligned proposer, being pi. And also a decision maker is going to be drawn every period, so we're looking at a case where proposer and decision maker are short-lived. In the paper, we'll extend this, but the main model has them as short-lived. The proposer is going to observe the state of the world as well as his own type, and is going to propose a reform, simple YS or complex YC. And then the decision maker will see the reform that was proposed, as well as a signal about the state of the world. The precision of that signal is one minus Z. Um, so the noise in the system is, is Z. Um, and Z varies from something close to zero, but not zero, because the decision maker never has perfect information about the state of the world, to uh, full noise being uh, one half. Given this uh, information for the decision maker, she approves or rejects the reform, where D is equal to one, signifies approved. Now, this is repeated every period, and what is the, the link between periods um, the reform that is approved at period T is going to change the noise Z in the next period so that if a complex reform is approved, the noise is going to go up. And if a simple reform is approved, the noise is going to go down by a fixed delta. And this is the only thing that changes in the baseline model between periods. The idea being that complex reforms make the world more complicated for the decision maker and therefore make the signal and the information extraction problem for the decision maker more complicated, whereas the simple reforms simplify it. Finally, uh, to to close the model, we need the payoffs. Um, so the decision maker is going to benefit from a simple reform if the state of the world requires simplicity, so if it's theta s, 
in which case the decision maker gets a benefit V. And this is regardless of who proposes it. If the state of the world requires complexity, the decision maker um, having uh, approved a simple reform gets a loss L. When a complex reform is proposed, it provides a positive uh, outcome if the proposer is of type A. Moreover, it provides the maximum positive outcome if the state of the world is theta C, so it requires complexity. This is the case of a good complex reform. If the state of the world doesn't require complexity, then uh, the payout is still positive from the reform, but the reform is overly complicated for the state of the world, so the decision maker pays an administrative cost A. If the complex reform is proposed by a B type of proposer, then the decision maker gets a loss, so these are the bad complex reforms, whereas the complex reforms in state data S with proposer A are the unnecessarily complex reforms. For the proposer, the payoff is going to be normalized to one whenever the proposed reform is being adopted um, and zero otherwise. Uh, the idea here being, as in the, described in the motivation, the fact that the proposer has the freedom to uh, propose a reform that is going to benefit that interest group. Um, so anything that is passed is going to benefit it. We are going to look at the best perfect equilibrium for the decision maker um, each period, um, given the short-lived decision maker. And when there's multiple such equilibria, we'll select the one that minimizes complexity, thus biasing us away from complexity. And what do we obtain? Uh, I'm showing this graphically because it might be simpler to visualize. Um, so this shows on the x-axis the kappa parameter, which is the probability that the state of the world requires complexity. On the vertical axis, we have pi, which is the probability that the proposer's type is A or a lambda. The best possible equilibrium for the decision maker, given the setup of the game, is the one in which the bad uh, or the B type of proposer does not propose a complex reform. And that is the equilibrium we call simplification. And it's represented in the blue area of the graph. So um, above a threshold pi one, that will be a function of, of Z, the information of the decision maker. Um, above this threshold, only the A type of proposer proposes a complex reform and only in the state of the world in which it is necessary and otherwise simple reforms are proposed. If kappa is too high or pi is too low, uh, this equilibrium is no longer sustainable. And we move to an equilibrium where both types of proposers propose complex reforms when the state of the world requires complexity. So this is the equilibrium where we have a bad reform uh, being proposed by the B type. Um, when this equilibrium is also no longer uh, sustainable, we have the complexification equilibrium denoted in red in the picture. Um, this equilibrium is the one in which we also have unnecessarily complex reforms, meaning that the A type of proposer proposes complex reforms all the time, and the B type of proposer proposes reforms that match the state of the world. And finally, in the green region, we have a pooling equilibrium where everyone proposes simple reforms. And in the white region, we have uh, an equilibrium where all reforms are rejected, so nothing is approved, whereas in the rest of the picture, uh, the reform is approved with prob positive probability. So the implication of this analysis is that if we look at where bad reforms are proposed, they are proposed in, this, um, in the yellow and red regions. So a complex reform by the B proposer is adopted only if the expected ability is intermediate. So we have pi in between pi 3 and pi 1. And unnecessarily complex reforms, so proposed by proposer A when state is state IS, uh, occur in the red region, so between pi 3 and pi 2, so also for intermediate pi's. 
So the first comparative static implication is that fixing any kappa, any probability of the state of the world requiring complexity, we have a non-monotone change in expected complexity as a function of pi, whereas only intermediate uh, pi's or uncertainty about the type of the proposer is what gives us bad or unnecessary reforms or complex reforms. Now, what happens dynamically? What I showed you in the picture was the representation for the bounds between these equilibria when z was at some intermediate value. The first picture here shows what happens with these bounds when z is at a low value, uh, essentially the pi one bound between the simplification and the matching equilibria is going to be shifted towards the left um, as z is small and is going to be shifting towards the right as z increases. Um, similarly, the bound um, of the, the region of unnecessary and bad reforms, so pi 3, is going to shift down as z increases. Um, and of course, as the decision maker has less information, the region of rejecting reforms or gridlock is going to increase. What this implies is that if we look at the endogenous evolution of z, we're going to be moving between these different, um, these different pictures. So fixing any point in these regions, we're going to see, for example, if you fix a point at um, kappa is equal to 0 0.4 and pi is equal to 0 0.6, so here. If z is small, you're in the matching equilibrium where you have reforms, complex reforms proposed by the bad type, the B type. However, if that passing of complex reforms leads to an endogenous increase in z, then our point kappa equal to 0 0.4 and pi equal to 0 0.6 is going to eventually switch into the simplification equilibrium as the bounds between these regions change uh, with z increasing endogenously. Um, and the question we ask is, given these changes in these bounds, uh, when is it that we're going to endogenously get cycling between having on average simpler reforms being proposed uh, versus more complex reforms? And we show that uh, such a region exists and exists uh, in uh, the region of the parameter space where pi and kappa are intermediate. Um, and for points in this region, essentially what happens is that you're going to have the endogenously uh, cycling uh, around some uh, intermediate value um, as uh, our point moves between matching and simplification equilibria. Um, and we show the same thing for moving between the red region and the blue region. About the cycling, we show again that it exists under intermediate pi and kappa. In the cycling region, the average complexity of the environment, or this noise z, is decreasing in pi and increasing in kappa. The implication being that complex reforms are less likely when the expected alignment between proposer and decision maker is higher. Um, and this is a feature of the strategic nature of the model. The second main result we have is that uh, we obtain path dependence, particularly again, if you look at these three figures and you look in the lower right side of the graph, you see that as z increases, um, any point in this part could be in, for example, at kappa equal to 0 0.8 and pi is equal to 0 0.2. If you start at low z, you start in the pooling equilibrium, simple reforms are proposed and, and passed, um, with pro positive probability. However, if you start at a high level of noise, you're in the region where everything is rejected and you're in gridlock. And similarly, there, uh, you can see that the red region, the one with um, unnecessary and bad complex reforms, also ex uh, expands as the increases. So depending on when you, where you start and what level of uh, information disadvantage for the decision maker, that's going to determine the path of Z moving forward. Um, and particularly if you start in the red region, you're going to stay on average in a region where complex reforms are being proposed. 
So you're going to enter this complexity trap. Whereas if you start in the region of rejection you're, or not, where nothing is passed, you're going to wanna stay there forever and therefore be locked into this gridlock. Um, so uh, this gives us an understanding of why is it that different uh, institutional environments starting from the same parameters kappa and pi might leave, might, might evolve in different ways just driven by the information disadvantage to, with which we start for the regulator. Now, um, I'm going to uh, kind of summarize the implications of this for regulatory complexity and stability. What we get is that simple rules beget simple rules if externalities are low or if the state of the world favors simplicity. Complex rules are going to beget complex rules if externalities are likely high and there is likely an alignment between the objectives of interest groups and those of regulators. We get regulatory instability in the form of cycling when there is high uncertainty about externalities and about an alignment, where again externalities tell us what the state of the world requires. And finally, we get sustained gridlock or a lack of reform if externalities are likely high and the objective of interest groups likely conflict with those of regulators. Um, so this is a kind of summarizing the model and I'm gonna stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. The discussion will be by Frédéric Malherbe. Hi everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today and to discuss this paper. Let me uh, share my screen. Should be fine now. Should rearrange. Okay. Okay, so uh, it's a super interesting paper. Um, as you have seen, there are a lot of uh, cases, a lot of equilibria. Well, depending on the region, we can be in a different kind of equilibrium, uh, but also in each region, there are many equilibria and I think uh, they select the one which is the most meaningful. So I'm not going to uh, to talk about that. But the, um, the beauty of being a discussant is that I don't have to deal with all these and I'll be able to zoom in uh, on uh, what is the most interesting and most important in my view in the paper. So I'll, I'll really uh, uh, focus on, on very specific uh, things. So let me uh, immediately jump uh, into, uh, into the setup. And we got a proposer uh, who proposes uh, reform. We have a decision maker, DM, uh, who decides whether or not to, uh, to accept uh, the reform, to adopt it. And the nature of the problem is very simple. There is a conflict of interest because the decision maker wants to make the right choice. Uh, I'll explain in a second uh, what it means. And the proposer, uh, in fact, uh, just wants to get uh, his or her reform to be adopted. The thing is that the, the, the proposer may be incompetent, which I will also qualify in a second, and, and therefore uh, the proposer may um, propose a reform whom uh, they know is bad, but still will want uh, it to be uh, to be passed. So we can summarize that in a simplified version uh, of the matrix that Dana, uh, uh, well, the matrix matrices that Dana uh, has shown. I've just flipped the dimensions around. I think sometimes it helps uh, me, and so probably it may help some of the uh, uh, the, the readers or the uh, the, the attendees uh, to to see what's going on. Uh, I just guess that different dimensions uh, work better graphically for different people. So uh, I'm focusing here on the ABLE proposer, so proposer A. Um, we have uh, a two by two matrix. The reform proposed can be either sim simple or complex, and the state can be the S state where we want an S reform. Well, we meaning the, uh, the decision maker, the, I, you can think about it in terms of social welfare, I guess. And C is the complex state where uh, the state requires a complex reform. So if the proposer is able and proposes a simple reform, 
uh, well, in the simple state, in the S state, you get a payoff of one, which is great. If um, the simple reform is proposed and adopted in the complex state, in the C state, then you get a negative payoff. And um, if the reform is complex in the S state, you still get a benefit. The idea being that, well, you would prefer a simple reform, but the naval proposer can still come up with something which is beneficial. But obviously, you will want that uh, the, the reform type matches the state. You get the highest payoff when uh, a complex reform is in a complex state and a simple reform in a simple state. Okay, so far, this is absolutely uh, uh, obvious, like this is the way uh, anyone uh, sensible would uh, set up the, uh, the, the model. Now, uh, when we come to the, um, to the bad proposer, B, I call him uh, the bad proposer, many different choices could have been made. I, I think that the, the, the choices are, uh, are sensible as well. Uh, if the bad proposer proposes a simple reform, we have the same payoffs as the able proposer. So if the state is indeed simple, a state, you get a payoff of one. If uh, it was a state that required a complex reform, then you get, uh, you get minus one. Now, uh, the key problem arises when the bad proposer offers or proposes a complex reform. Because if the state is complex, even though you would like a complex reform, you want it to be designed by someone able, someone competent, not someone who has no clue. And so you also get a negative payoff uh, uh, in this case. And it's even worse if the complex reform proposed by a bad proposer is adopted in a S state. Okay, so that's the worst uh, possible outcome. And to, um, to, to, to close the, the, all the possible uh, payoff uh, for uh, the um, decision maker. If the decision maker turns down the reform, uh, the, the payoff is normalized to, uh, to zero. So what's the problem here? Well, um, the proposer just wants the reform to be adopted. So we don't even need to deal with, uh, the, with the payoffs. It's just positive if it's adopted, negative if not. And so it is obvious that there will be a lot of cases where the bad proposer will want to mimic what the uh, able proposer uh, does because the decision maker will want to, uh, to, to, to adopt good reforms, like the best possible reforms are typically uh, proposed by the competent able proposer. Okay, so um, I will try to highlight the key mechanism uh, of the game and actually of the, of the paper, focusing on a very specific uh, case. And I will even throw some more uh, numbers to really make, make it super concrete. So the way it works is that the decision maker observes a signal on the state. So whether it's an S state or a C state, um, let's say that the prior is 0.5 and you get uh, an informative signal about it and then uh, makes a decision. Now imagine that there is an equilibrium where the decision maker always accepts. Uh, and then given the payoffs I've shown you, it's obvious that the, the bad proposer B will propose a complex reform in the C state. So uh, first, Wait, I just need to move this thing here. Sorry about that. Good. Um, so let's first have a look at the able proposer. Well, um, the able proposer is in an equilibrium where the decision maker always accepts. So uh, there is no reason to do something bad. Let's just propose what, uh, what, what is the best for society. And so we just get the, the best possible outcome here. It's obvious that from the able proposer, that's something which is uh, a part of an equilibrium. Now, if we go to the bad proposer, well, imagine that, well, I forgot to mention, but uh, you have guessed that and uh, you have heard that from that, but the, uh, the proposer knows the state. So imagine that the bad proposer knows that the state is C, there is no reason not to propose a simple reform. Everything is fine. Now, if the, the bad proposer knows that the state Oh, sorry, I said C, but it was S, of course. Now, if the bad proposer knows that the state is C, then, um, well, uh, the if, well, there is nothing good that could be done. In fact, uh, that's not in the, in the model, but the, you would like the bad proposer to say, I'll pass on this one. There's nothing I can do here. But instead, the bad proposer will propose a complex reform because this is the same action as the able proposer. And so in a way, that's how you hide, uh, you mimic, and you get the high payoff there, okay? And so this can be an equilibrium uh, that's called the matching equilibrium in, uh, in, in the paper, and it will be sustained for some uh, um, parameter values uh, that uh, Dana has, uh, has, uh, has shown you. Now, 
with my payoffs here and with the prior I've told you, it's pretty clear that if the prior is higher that you get an able proposer than a bad proposer, uh, the, the equilibrium is sustainable. The key thing here to, to have that straightforward uh, a conclusion is that in, in such an equilibrium, the state is fully revealed when you observed the proposal, right? If you observe a simple proposal, you know you're in the S state. If you observe a complex proposal, you know you are in the C state. And so uh, that's pretty obvious. Then you, you just look at your posterior, whether you think that uh, it's more high, it's more probable that you have a bad or a good guy and, uh, and things are not. Now imagine that um, the probability to get the bad guy is greater than a half, 0.55 then it's obvious that this cannot be an equilibrium because uh, you would have the decision maker would like to turn down complex reform tier. So that's unfortunate, but that cannot be an equilibrium. And so this is where things become uh, very interesting because imagine that it said um, A, the able proposer now always proposes a complex reform. Then uh, what, will, what will happen? So what we have here, instead of selecting these two, this is the strategy of the able proposer, you go for complex uh, in both states. Now, in that case, what we have is that if the decision maker observes a simple reform, um, it, is no, it is no longer just the state that is, uh, that is revealed, it's the state and, well, the, the combination, the union of the state and the bad proposer. If you have a simple reform, you know that you are in a simple state and it is a bad proposer, you should accept it. Okay, so that's the easy one. But then when you observe a complex reform, you know that you can be in any of those three cases. And in a sense, it creates more noise or like it's a more complex problem. Uh, and this, the state is no longer revo revealed. That's a very, that's really the key element here. The state is no longer revealed by what you observe and you need to do a little bit of Bayesian updating. And it turns out that you can have an equilibrium uh, uh, that looks like this. So let me show you with some numbers. I still assume that the probability to get the B guy in the first place is 0.55. So we are in the case where the matching equilibrium is not sustainable, the one I've uh, shown you just before. And imagine that given the signal that you observe, um, you think that the state C uh, is, uh, uh, occurs with probability 0.6. Then, well, you just do Bayesian updating, right? Uh, I'm just writing for you here the condition, well, the expected payoff um, well, if you want the condition expected payoff, you just divide by uh, something at row, so it doesn't matter uh, to the sign of the, the, this guy here. But uh, the first one here, you know that with probability 0.4, you have a good guy and, oh, sorry, uh, no, that's this one here. With probability 0.4, you are in um, the S state and with probability 0.45, you have a good guy and then uh, you get uh, uh, this uh, payoff here, and you do it for the three possible payoffs, turns out that it is positive, okay? So if you knew that you were in the C state, you know that you get uh, these two, they are the same uh, magnitude, it's more likely to, to get the bad proposer, you don't want the reform. But when, in a sense, you pull that additional state uh, 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 together, then uh, you're a bit more not confused, but uncertain, and the, the probability mass that you have added there gives you a positive payoff, which may be enough to tilt the balance into accepting the reform. And this is how you get overcomplexification in the model, because uh, if you could change one thing, you would just ask the able proposer to pick a simple uh, reform here, and that would be a Pareto improvement, because both in this equilibrium and what I propose, which is not an equilibrium, you would have um, uh, the proposers super happy, they get all their proposal accepted, and the, the decision maker would be strictly better off. Unfortunately, this is not an equilibrium, and this is where the over qualifier comes in over complexification. Okay, so that's really what is the key mechanism in the static part of the model. And then I think uh, the, the dynamic part, the most interesting uh, dimensions of the dynamic part part become uh, uh, straightforward to, ex to explain because when you adopt a comp complex reform, uh, the model is set up in a way that you decrease the precision of the, uh, of the signal. And then depending on parameter values, this can either create a vicious circle. This is what uh, they call the uh, complexity trap or be stabilizing. This is uh, what they call uh, the cycling. You cycle between compl oh, well, complexification and simplification. 
And so this is, I think, how you can uh, make all the results of the paper uh, uh, fit together in a simplified and a little bit uh, uh, loosely explained uh, five, 10 minutes uh, presentation. Okay. And so what's the interest of the paper is, you know, there are many cases There are like, this is actually much more complicated than I, I've made it look, but uh, what they do is to carefully discuss all possible cases, uh, characterize the dynamics, it's super well done, and, and it's, uh, it, is, uh, it is very clear. The only one complaint, it's not a complaint, it's just that uh, I don't see how they could go around that, is that there are so many cases and so many things that it's sometimes a little bit tedious to go over to that, probably more for them because they had to do all the analysis than for the reader because it's still uh, a quite enjoyable to, to read. Maybe one thing uh, that could be done is try to even better highlight and stream, streamline, streamline uh, what is the most interesting thing, but I don't have a very good suggestion on, on how to do that. So let me offer uh, some uh, comments, uh, um, like more general comments. Um, one uh, that's puzzled me, one thing that puzzled me a little bit there, and I think it would be <laughs> nice to explain a little better uh, what's going on there, but um, in a sense, I'd like to have commitment here or to have commitment, well, as a decision maker, I'd like to have commitment because um, I think I would benefit from committing to ignore my, my signal. Uh, I'm talking about the case where I am here. The reason why this is not an equilibrium when uh, the probabilities are such that, uh, well, the ones I have made up here, it's because, well, uh, um, I, um, I know that in the complex, uh, in the complex states, uh, I don't want the reform. And so uh, imagine that I could ignore my signal or just uh, close my eyes and I just don't want to, uh, to see it, then in expectation, I would just be better off always accepting the reform if these guys uh, uh, were doing the simple reform uh, here. So I would just be better off. And of course the proposer would be better off as well. And so in a sense, uh, uh, this is kind of an easy fix for that. So there may be many reasons why in the real world this would not be possible, but since we are thinking about institutional context and design and how institutions evolve over time, this is kind of something like in terms of institutional reform, this is something that I, I, I would be tempted to do and it's a little bit not paradoxical, but counterintuitive and so, uh, that is something that uh, I, I, I thought a bit interesting. Okay, so um, now let me give something which is completely outside uh, uh, of the paper because you know you have to make choice and to to explain how you interpret the uh, the your, your model and how you go from your starting point, your questions to the model to to the results. But in my view, simple reforms are sometimes extremely complicated to come up with. Um, it depends, like it's really, uh, we are talking about terminology here and I don't want to be pedantic. And so it's just like, uh, it's probably about a different paper and I'm not asking you to make the current paper that paper, but I think th these are very interesting, I think to think of. So imagine, think of the tax code. You come up with a, you know, there is new green energy, something like that. And you want to add something, tax deductibility for some green investment or things like that. The easy way to do that is super simple. You just add a layer. You add a rule that adds up to all the existing tax rules. And in fact, by adding a new simple rule, you make the whole tax code more complex. If uh, instead you would like to do a very complex reform, which will be to simplify everything, restart from scratch, and then you have to, de to deal with the horrible task to transition from one system to a completely brand new system. This is extremely complex to manage in terms of project management, in terms of transition, that is a, a, a nightmare. But then if you do that, you end up with a much more simple and transparent environment. And this is clearly, clearly something that you cannot uh, capture in your model. And, you know, it's fine. I think uh, as a referee, I would definitely be able to, to live with it. But I think maybe you, you could use all your machinery and all the thoughts that you have put in that to also try to think about this. Because I think this is one dimension of complexity versus sim simplicity, which is absolutely essential in terms of government, in terms of, in terms of uh, institutions. Um, and finally, but uh, that's, that's very simple, uh, and it's linked perhaps with the commitments uh, comments here. Like, uh, again, 
we are thinking about institutions or how they are designed or they evolve. And um, I would be tempted to think about it more in terms of mechanism design and to, to think of a, a very uh, specific game. But I think for the, for the pur purpose of your analysis of the, of the paper, that, that, does, that wouldn't make sense to, uh, to do all that because the paper is already rich enough. Now for future research, if you write follow up papers, if they could have that dimensions, I think I'd, I'd be even more uh, eager to, uh, to read them. And this is all I have. That's a great paper. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dana, you want to respond? Oh, yes, uh, thank you very much, Fred, uh, for these really uh, helpful comments and, and very clear discussion. Um, and it's actually, I, I uh, completely agree on the commitment comment that um, at the core of the, the paper is this distortion that is kind of inherent to political economy, that we don't have the ability to commit for the, the decision maker. And if the decision maker could commit to ignore its signal, then then over complexification would go away. So it's um, it's very um, I think it, it, it's something that we could put in the paper much more clear at the beginning as the main kind of reason why this distortion emerges and a very I guess political economy reason. Um, and on the the point about simplifying, um, also it's something that uh, we've been discussing as a way to think about um, the. Uh, reforms that we have in the paper now have this flavor of gradual reforms, like you, you add the provision or you subtract the provision. And um, the point about this simplifying and starting from scratch, these radical reforms is something that is the next thing on our agenda of thinking about when do you choose to go gradually versus when do you choose to, to have these radical reforms um, and when is that feasible? So, so that's really uh, a helpful comment. Um, and uh, similarly with the mechanism design part, um, as we took here a, a more positive political economy approach of describing what happens given these distortions, uh, I guess the, the flip side of that is to think about what is optimal. Um, and uh, that's also something that we've been discussing. So I don't know if Massimo wants to add um, anything else. Thank um, you very much. Yes. Uh, thank, can you hear me? Yes. Go, go ahead. Yes. Um, yes, thank you very much, very much, Frederick. This is a uh, fantastic um, comments you gave us. Uh, one, one remark I want to add is perhaps uh, for the audience to find uh, a, another arching connection between what uh, Dana has presented and the previous paper, actually. Because one thing that I want to notice that is also on, uh, on the future agenda that uh, is uh, usually problematic in political economy is that uh, when we talk about institutions, strong and weak, we don't have very good definitions, right? Uh, and and uh, one thing is that, for example, a, a weak institution or a weak state, like in the previous uh, paper, uh, is usually connected with, for example, overspending, right? Whereas what we point out is that even in the cases in which uh, the, the decision maker is actually benevolent and so it wouldn't pass, it wouldn't overpass reforms, for example. It wouldn't be the, the sort of, you know, Italian or Greek overspending, overpassing decision maker. Still, uh, having weak institution has more to do with the quality of proposers, such that if the quality of proposers is not good, you can have other types of inefficiencies that I could also relate to uh, weak uh, countries, namely Overcomplexification, which definitely you find examples in, in my paper, for example, from Weber to Kafka, or uh, or uh, gridlock that basically make uh, the reform uh, the reformism very difficult, right? And so overall, I think that uh, you know the the uh, in the future it would be great to find uh, even more uh, interactions on how you know this type of of analysis we do on the on the uh, you know endogenous uh, uh, appearance of different types of reforms uh, connects more broadly with the macro uh, implications of institutions that's all i'd say thank you as i conclude i would again like to make three remarks <laughs> the first first one follows up on frederic malherbe's comment on uh, complexity. 
At one meeting where I was, uh, Elki Likanen, uh, the head of the Finnish Central Bank, introduced Mervyn King uh, for a lecture. And he began by saying that he, when he had been finance minister in Finland in 1990, he implemented the K. King proposals for simplifying the corporate tax systems. And following that, he was the most unpopular politician in Finland. That was Elke's uh, remark. The second point, something that concerns me is that I have some difficulties seeing the substance of the meaning of the words simple and complex in the formalism of the model. It really seems to be matching to state S and matching to state C. Uh, and so usually I associate it a little bit more with the terms simple and complex. My third remark also draws a connection to the first presentation. The first presentation used the, use the World Bank uh, tables for quality of government or quality of administration. Uh, a few years ago, I was involved in giving a prize to a political science paper. This was a prize on research on bureaucracy, which asked the following question, what explains the growth of rules across OECD countries, for the decades 75 to 2005, 1975 to 2005 in the areas of social policy, labor market regulation and environmental policy. Two findings. The composition of the government has no effect. I.e. if you have a red government or a red green government you don't get any more rule growth than if you have a, a black government or whatever you call them. The one thing that did have an effect was quality of bureaucracy according to the standards of the World Bank. And the greater the quality, the smaller the rule growth. Uh, the, 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 the remarkable thing there uh, was that uh, they really had a, a very detailed and very convincing account of what they mean by rule growth. They had gone through the legislation item by item on and, and looked at what does this actually regulate. So the results of that work, and I'll uh, send uh, you uh, the reference suggests that there are stable things about quality of administrations which explain differences. Uh, the authors tried to give something in terms of learning. I didn't find that uh, very convincing, but the simple uh, empirical finding that they have was uh, convincing. Uh, with that, I close the session, I guess, uh, the discussion room but the discussion continues in the discussion room. That's right. I think Tamara already uh, posted the discussion room uh, meeting IDs and passwords. So uh, please feel free to join them and we'll resume at uh, 4.30.